Section 14 of Reflections on the Revolution in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reflections on the Revolution in France and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event in a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790, by Edmund Burke. Section 14. If your clergy, or any clergy, should show themselves vicious beyond the fair bounds allowed to human infirmity, and to those professional faults which can hardly be separated from professional virtues, though their vices never can countenance the exercise of oppression, I do admit that they would naturally have the effect of abating very much of our indignation against the tyrants who exceed measure and justice in their punishment. I can allow in clergymen, through all their divisions, some tenaciousness of their own opinion, some overflowings of zeal for its propagation, some predilection to their own state and office, some attachment to the interests of their own corps, some preference to those who listen with docility to their doctrines beyond those who scorn and deride them. I allow all this, because I am a man who have to deal with men, and who would not, through a violence of toleration, run into the greatest of all intolerance. I must bear with infirmities until they fester into crimes. Undoubtedly, the natural progress of the passions, from frailty to vice, ought to be prevented by a watchful eye and a firm hand. But is it true that the body of your clergy had passed those limits of a just allowance? From the general style of your late publications, of all sorts, one would be led to believe that your clergy in France were a sort of monsters an horrible composition of superstition, ignorance, sloth, fraud, avarice, and tyranny. But is this true? Is it true that the lapse of time, the cessation of conflicting interests, the woeful experience of the evils resulting from party rage, have had no sort of influence gradually to ameliorate their minds? Is it true that they were daily renewing invasions on the civil power, troubling the domestic quiet of their country, and rendering the operations of its government feeble and precarious? Is it true that the clergy of our times have pressed down the laity with an iron hand, and were in all places lighting up the fires of a savage persecution? Did they, by every fraud, endeavor to increase their estates? Did they use to exceed the due demands on estates that were their own? Or rigidly screwing up right into wrong, did they convert a legal claim into a vexatious extortion? When not possessed of power, were they filled with the vices of those who envy it? Were they inflamed with a violent, litigious spirit of controversy? Goaded on with the ambition of intellectual sovereignty, were they ready to fly in the face of all magistracy, to fire churches, to massacre the priests of other descriptions, to pull down altars, and to make their way over the ruins of subverted governments to an empire of doctrine? sometimes flattering, sometimes forcing the consciences of men from the jurisdiction of public institutions into a submission to their personal authority, beginning with the claim of liberty and ending with an abuse of power? These, or some of these, were the vices objected, and not wholly without foundation, to several of the churchmen of former times, who belonged to two great parties, which then divided and distracted Europe. If there was in France, as in other countries there visibly is, a great abatement, rather than any increase of these vices, instead of loading the present clergy with the crimes of other men, and the odious character of other times, in common equity they ought to be praised, encouraged, and supported in their departure from a spirit which disgraced their predecessors, and for having assumed a temper of mind and manners more suitable to their sacred function. When my occasions took me into France, towards the close of the late reign, the clergy, under all their forms, engaged a considerable part of my curiosity. So far from finding, except from one set of men, not then very numerous, though very active, the complaints and discontents against that body which some publications had given me reason to expect, I perceived little or no public or private uneasiness on their account. On further examination, I found the clergy, in general, 
persons of moderate minds and decorous manners i include the seculars and the regulars of both sexes i had not the good fortune to know a great many of the parochial clergy but in general i received a perfectly good account of their morals and of their attention to their duties with some of the higher clergy i had a personal acquaintance and of the rest in that class a very good means of information they were almost all of them persons of noble birth they resembled others of their own rank and where there was any difference it was in their favor they were more fully educated than the military noblesse so as by no means to disgrace their profession by ignorance or by want of fitness for the exercise of their authority they seemed to me beyond the clerical character liberal and open with the hearts of gentlemen and men of honor neither insolent nor servile in their manners and conduct they seemed to me rather a superior class a set of men amongst whom you would not be surprised to find a fenelon i saw among the clergy in paris many of the description are not to be met with anywhere men of great learning and candor and i had reason to believe that this description was not confined to paris what i found in other places i know was accidental and therefore to be presumed a fair sample i spent a few days in a provincial town where in the absence of the bishop i passed my evenings with three clergymen his vicar's general persons who would have done honor to any church they were all well informed two of them of deep general and extensive erudition ancient and modern oriental and western particularly in their own profession they had a more extensive knowledge of our english divines than i expected and they entered into the genius of those writers with a critical accuracy one of these gentlemen is since dead the abbe morangui i pay this tribute without reluctance to the memory of that noble reverend learned and excellent person and i should do the same with equal cheerfulness to the merits of the others who i believe are still living if i did not fear to hurt those whom i am unable to serve some of these ecclesiastics of rank are by all titles persons deserving of general respect they are deserving of gratitude from me and from many english if this letter should ever come into their hands i hope they will believe there are those of our nation who feel for their unmerited fall and for the cruel confiscation of their fortunes with no common sensibility what i say of them is a testimony as far as one feeble voice can go which i owe to truth whenever the question of this unnatural persecution is concerned i will pay it no one shall prevent me from being just and grateful the time is fitted for the duty and it is particularly becoming to show our justice and gratitude when those who have deserved well of us and of mankind are laboring under popular obloquy and the persecutions of oppressive power you had before your revolution about a hundred and twenty bishops a few of them were men of eminent sanctity and charity without limit when we talk of the heroic of course we talk of rare virtue i believe the instances of eminent depravity may be as rare amongst them as those of transcendent goodness examples of avarice and of licentiousness may be picked out i do not question it by those who delight in the investigation which leads to such discoveries a man as old as i am will not be astonished that several in every description do not lead that perfect life of self-denial with regard to wealth or to pleasure which is wished for by all by some expected but by none exacted with more rigor than by those who are the most attentive to their own interests or the most indulgent to their own passions when i was in france i am certain that the number of vicious prelates was not great certain individuals among them not distinguishable for the regularity of their lives made some amends for their want of the severe virtues in their possession of the liberal and were endowed with qualities which made them useful in the church and state i am told that with few exceptions louis the sixteenth had been more attentive to character in his promotions to that rank than his immediate predecessor and i believe as some spirit of reform has prevailed through the whole reign that it may be true but the present ruling power has shown a disposition only to plunder the church 
it has punished all prelates which is to favor the vicious at least in point of reputation it has made a degrading pensionary establishment to which no man of liberal ideas or liberal condition will destine his children it must settle into the lowest classes of the people as with you the inferior clergy are not numerous enough for their duties as these duties are beyond measure minute and toilsome as you have left no middle classes of clergy at their ease in future nothing of science or erudition can exist in the gallican church to complete the project without the least attention to the rights of patrons the assembly has provided in future an elective clergy an arrangement which will drive out of the clerical profession all men of sobriety all who can pretend to independence in their function or their conduct and which will throw the whole direction of the public mind into the hands of a set of licentious bold crafty factious flattering wretches of such condition and such habits of life as will make their contemptible pensions in comparison of which the stipend of an excise man is lucrative and honorable an object of low and illiberal intrigue those officers whom they still call bishops are to be elected to a provision comparatively mean through the same arts that is electioneering arts by men of all religious tenets that are known or can be invented the new lawgivers have not ascertained anything whatsoever concerning their qualifications relative either to doctrine or to morals no more than they have done with regard to the subordinate clergy nor does it appear but that both the higher and the lower may at their discretion practice or preach any mode of religion or irreligion that they please i do not yet see what the jurisdiction of bishops over their subordinates is to be or whether they are to have any jurisdiction at all in short sir it seems to me that this new ecclesiastical establishment is intended only to be temporary and preparatory to the utter abolition under any of its forms of the christian religion whenever the minds of men are prepared for this last stroke against it by the accomplishment of the plan for bringing its ministers into universal contempt they who will not believe that the philosophical fanatics who guide in these matters have long entertained such a design are utterly ignorant of their character and proceedings these enthusiasts do not scruple to avow their opinion that a state can subsist without any religion better than with one and that they are able to supply the place of any good which may be in it by a project of their own namely by a sort of education they have imagined founded in a knowledge of the physical wants of men progressively carried to an enlightened self-interest which when well understood they tell us will identify with an interest more enlarged and public the scheme of this education has been long known of late they distinguish it as they have got an entirely new nomenclature of technical terms by the name of a civic education i hope their partisans in england to whom i rather attribute very inconsiderate conduct than the ultimate object in this detestable design will succeed neither in the pillage of the ecclesiastics nor in the introduction of a principle of popular election to our bishoprics and parochial cures this in the present condition of the world would be the last corruption of the church the utter ruin of the clerical character the most dangerous shock that the state ever received through a misunderstood arrangement of religion i know well enough that the bishoprics and cures under kingly and seniorial patronage as now they are in england and as they have been lately in france are sometimes acquired by unworthy methods but the other mode of ecclesiastical canvas subjects them infinitely more surely and more generally to all the evil arts of low ambition which operating on and through greater numbers will produce mischief in proportion those of you who have robbed the clergy think that they shall easily reconcile their conduct to all protestant nations because the clergy whom they have thus plundered degraded and given over to mockery and scorn are of the roman catholic that is of their own pretended persuasion i have no doubt that some miserable bigots will be found here as well as elsewhere who hate sects and parties different from their own more than they love the substance of religion 
and who are more angry with those who differ from them in their particular plans and systems than displeased with those who attack the foundation of our common hope these men will write and speak on the subject in the manner that is to be expected from their temper and character burnett says that when he was in france in the year sixteen eighty three the method which carried over the men of the finest parts to popery was this they brought themselves to doubt of the whole christian religion when that was once done it seemed a more indifferent thing of what side or form they continued outwardly if this was then the ecclesiastic policy of france it is what they have since but too much reason to repent of they preferred atheism to a form of religion not agreeable to their ideas they succeeded in destroying that form and atheism has succeeded in destroying them i can readily give credit to burnett's story because i have observed too much of a similar spirit for a little of it is much too much amongst ourselves the humor however is not general the teachers who reformed our religion in england bore no sort of resemblance to your present reforming doctors in paris perhaps they were like those whom they opposed rather more than could be wished under the influence of a party spirit but they were most sincere believers men of the most fervent and exalted piety ready to die as some of them did die like true heroes in defence of their particular ideas of christianity as they would with equal fortitude and more cheerfully for that stock of general truth for the branches of which they contended with their blood these men would have disavowed with horror those wretches who claimed a fellowship with them upon no other titles than those of their having pillaged the persons with whom they maintained controversies and their having despised the common religion for the purity of which they exerted themselves with a zeal which unequivocally bespoke their highest reverence for the substance of that system which they wished to reform many of their descendants have retained the same zeal but as less engaged in conflict with more moderation they do not forget that justice and mercy are substantial parts of religion impious men do not recommend themselves to their communion by iniquity and cruelty towards any description of their fellow creatures we hear these new teachers continually boasting of their spirit of toleration that those persons should tolerate all opinions who think none to be of estimation is a matter of small merit equal neglect is not impartial kindness the species of benevolence which arises from contempt is no true charity there are in england abundance of men who tolerate in the true spirit of toleration they think the dogmas of religion though in different degrees are all of moment and that amongst them there is as amongst all things of value a just ground of preference they favor therefore and they tolerate they tolerate not because they despise opinions but because they respect justice they would reverently and affectionately protect all religions because they love and venerate the great principle upon which they all agree and the great object to which they are all directed they begin more and more plainly to discern that we have all a common cause as against a common enemy they will not be so misled by the spirit of faction as not to distinguish what is done in favor of their subdivision from those acts of hostility which through some particular description are aimed at the whole corps in which they themselves under another denomination are included it is impossible for me to say what may be the character of every description of men amongst us but i speak for the greater part and for them i must tell you that sacrilege is no part of their doctrine of good works that so far from calling you into their fellowship on such title if your professors are admitted to their communion they must carefully conceal their doctrine of the lawfulness of the proscription of innocent men and that they must make restitution of all stolen goods whatsoever till then they are none of ours you may suppose that we do not approve your confiscation of the revenues of bishops and deans and chapters and parochial clergy possessing independent estates arising from land because we have the same sort of establishment in england that objection you will say 
cannot hold as to the confiscation of the goods of monks and nuns and the abolition of their order it is true that this particular part of your general confiscation does not affect england as a precedent in point but the reason applies and it goes a great way the long parliament confiscated the lands of deans and chapters in england on the same ideas upon which your assembly set to sale the lands of the monastic orders but it is in the principle of injustice that the danger lies and not in the description of persons on whom it is first exercised i see in a country very near us a course of policy pursued which sets justice the common concern of mankind at defiance with the national assembly of france possession is nothing law and usage are nothing i see the national assembly openly reprobate the doctrine of prescription which one of the greatest of their own lawyers footnote doma and a footnote tells us with great truth is a part of the law of nature he tells us that the positive ascertainment of its limits and its security from invasion were among the causes for which civil society itself has been instituted if prescription be once shaken no species of property is secure when it once becomes an object large enough to tempt the cupidity of indigent power i see a practice perfectly correspondent to their contempt of this great fundamental part of natural law i see the confiscators begin with bishops and chapters and monasteries but i do not see them end there i see the princess of the blood who by the oldest usages of that kingdom held large landed estates hardly with the complement of a debate deprived of their possessions and in lieu of their stable independent property reduced to the hope of some precarious charitable pension at the pleasure of an assembly which of course will pay little regard to the rights of pensioners at pleasure when it despises those of legal proprietors flushed with the insolence of their first inglorious victories and pressed by the distresses caused by their lust of unhallowed lucre disappointed but not discouraged they have at length ventured completely to subvert all property of all descriptions throughout the extent of a great kingdom they have compelled all men in all transactions of commerce in the disposal of lands in civil dealing and through the whole communion of life to accept as perfect payment and good and lawful tender the symbols of their speculations on a projected sale of their plunder what vestiges of liberty or property have they left the tenant right of a cabbage garden a year's interest in a hovel the goodwill of an alehouse or a baker's shop the very shadow of a constructive property are more ceremoniously treated in our parliament than with you the oldest and most valuable landed possessions in the hands of the most respectable personages or than the whole body of the moneyed and commercial interest of your country we entertain a high opinion of the legislative authority but we have never dreamt that parliaments had any right whatever to violate property to overrule prescription or to force a currency of their own fiction in the place of that which is real and recognized by the law of nations but you who began with refusing to submit to the most moderate restraints have ended by establishing an unheard-of despotism i find the ground upon which your confiscators go is this that indeed their proceedings could not be supported in a court of justice but that the rules of prescription cannot bind a legislative assembly footnote speech of monsieur Camus, published by order of the national assembly and footnote so that this legislative assembly of a free nation sits not for the security but for the destruction of property and not of property only but of every rule and maxim which can give it stability and of those instruments which can alone give it circulation when the anabaptists of munster in the sixteenth century had filled germany with confusion by their system of leveling and their wild opinions concerning property to what country in europe did not the progress of their fury furnish just cause of alarm of all things wisdom is the most terrified with epidemical fanaticism because of all enemies it is that against which she is the least able to furnish any kind of resource 
we cannot be ignorant of the spirit of atheistical fanaticism that is inspired by a multitude of writings dispersed with incredible assiduity and expense and by sermons delivered in all the streets and places of public resort in paris these writings and sermons have filled the populace with a black and savage atrocity of mind which supersedes in them the common feelings of nature as well as all sentiments of morality and religion insomuch that these wretches are induced to bear with a sullen patience the intolerable distresses brought upon them by the violent convulsions and permutations that have been made in property footnote whether the following description is strictly true i know not but it is what the publishers would have passed for true in order to animate others in a letter from toy given in one of their papers is the following passage concerning the people of that district dans la révolution actuelle ils ont résisté à toutes les séductions du bigotisme aux persécutions et aux tracasseries des ennemis de la révolution oubliant leurs plus grands intérêts pour rendre hommage aux vues d'ordre général qui ont déterminé l'assemblée nationale ils voient sans se plaindre supprimer cette foule d'établissements ecclésiastiques par lesquels ils subsistaient et même en perdant leur siège épiscopal la seule de toutes ces ressources qui pouvaient ou plutôt qui devaient en toute équité leur être conservées condamnés à la plus effrayante misère sans avoir été ni pu être entendus ils ne murmurent point ils restent fidèles aux principes du plus pur patriotisme ils sont encore prêts à verser leur sang pour le maintien de la constitution qui va réduire leur ville à la plus déplorable nullité these people are not supposed to have endured those sufferings and injustices in a struggle for liberty for the same account states truly that they have always been free their patience in beggary and ruin and their suffering without remonstrance the most flagrant and confessed injustice if strictly true can be nothing but the effect of this dire fanaticism a great multitude all over france is in the same condition and the same temper End of footnote. the spirit of proselytism attends the spirit of fanaticism they have societies to cabal and correspond at home and abroad for the propagation of their tenets the republic of Bern, one of the happiest the most prosperous and the best governed countries upon earth is one of the great objects at the destruction of which they aim i am told they have in some measure succeeded in sowing there the seeds of discontent they are busy throughout germany spain and italy have not been untried england is not left out of the comprehensive scheme of their malignant charity and in england we find those who stretch out their arms to them who recommend their example from more than one pulpit and who choose in more than one periodical meeting publicly to correspond with them to applaud them and to hold them up as objects for imitation who receive from them tokens of confraternity and standards consecrated amidst their rites and mysteries who suggest to them leagues of perpetual amity at the very time when the power to which our constitution has exclusively delegated the federative capacity of this kingdom may find it expedient to make war upon them it is not the confiscation of our church property from this example in france that i dread though i think this would be no trifling evil the great source of my solicitude is lest it should ever be considered in england as the policy of a state to seek a resource in confiscations of any kind or that any one description of citizens should be brought to regard any of the others as their proper prey footnote si plures sunt i quibus improbe datum est quam illi quibus injuste ademptum est id circo plus etiam valent non enim numero haec judicantur sed pondere quam autem habet aequitatem ut agrum multis annis aut etiam saeculis ante possessum qui nullum habuit habeat qui autem habuit amitat ac propter hoc in iuriae genus lacedaemonii lusandrum eporum expulerunt agin regem quod numquam antea apud eos acciderat nec averunt exque eo tempore tantae discordiae secutae sunt ut et tyranni existerent et optimates exterminarentur 
et preclarissime constituta republica di laberetur, nec vero solum ipsa cecidit, sed etiam reliquam graeciam evertit contagionibus malorum, quae ala cedaimoniis profectae manarunt latius. After speaking of the conduct of the model of true patriots, Eretus of Sision, which was in a very different spirit, he says, Sic par est agere cum civibus, non ut bis iam vidimus hastam in foro ponere, et bona civium voci subicere praeconis. At ille graecus, id, quod fuit sapientis et praestantis viri, omnibus consulendum esse putavit, eaque est summa ratio et sapientia boni civis, commoda civium non divellere, sed omnes eadem aequitate continere. Cicero de Officiis End of footnote End of section 14